welcome back to Jobs, Money, Debt, Economic Common Sense, a new online weekly video for debunking myths concerning unemployment, deficits, and the national debt and our monetary system, and how we can create sustainable prosperity for the 21st century. Let the discussion commence. The old line from the early 1970s, we're all Keynesians now, has been attributed to both Richard Nixon and Milton Friedman. And Herb Stein even wrote, we're all functional financiers now, though he was largely conflating functional finance and the deficit dove views. But increasingly since the 1980s, a more accurate statement would be, we are all deficit hawks now. Hawks see government budget deficits and the national debt as almost always and everywhere bad for the economy. We hear the same tired arguments over and over again from politicians, journalists, and yes, from economists. Government budget deficits cause inflation. Deficits cause high interest rates. Various versions of the old crowding out argument that deficits are partially or fully offset by reductions in private spending. So I would always make the case that continuing the addiction of spending and deficits and printing money, manipulating the, the uh, economy is much, much worse than taking your medicine, which would mean that you got to quit and you just can't wean it off. So I would say you ought to face the consequences, but that, that won't happen unless people decide what kind of government they want. If they want governments to police where we have a military that polices the world and we have an endless welfare state, Although, you can't do it. it they're not going to happen. As I've pointed out many times, the key to understanding the economic theory underpinning these arguments is that deficit hawks view the macroeconomy from the standpoint of neoclassical economics. And the two pillars of neoclassical macro are the pre-Keynesian supply side ideas that the market system tends to full employment in the long run and that savings determine investment through changes in the rate of interest. The latter is the old loanable funds model that Keynes effectively demolished in the 1930s. Now, as far as the argument that deficits cause inflation, everyone agrees that because deficit spending increases demand, if the economy is at or very close to full employment, increasing deficit spending will cause inflation. The difference is whether the economy tends to be at full employment. If there's considerable slack in the economy, then deficit spending will increase output and income rather than prices. Likewise, if we are at full employment, then government spending can only employ resources if those resources are taken away from some other use, crowding out. But the crowding out and the argument that deficits cause high interest rates is also made from the perspective that all spending financed by borrowing, including government spending, depends on a pre-existing pool of savings. If deficits are financed out of the same relatively fixed supply of savings, then increased competition from the government to borrow bids up interest rates. And if government borrows some of that savings, less is available for the private sector to borrow, crowding out. Of course, setting aside for the moment a better theoretical understanding of the macroeconomy and the financial system, history and empirical evidence seem to refute these views. We've had good-sized deficits with interest rates and inflation at historic lows. 
The interest rate argument also is puzzling, given the widespread acknowledgement these days that the central bank controls short-term rates. This is why it has become much more common these days for the deficit hysteria arguments to be made in terms of either the national debt is a burden on future generations or the economics is abandoned and the hawk arguments are made in terms of anti-government politics or 19th century Victorian morality. Has been burying our children and our grandchildren, both born and unborn, under a mountain of debt. Just to give an idea of the kind of misunderstandings that abound, Ronald Reagan said, if you stack dollar bills one on top of another equal to the value of the national debt, it would reach to the moon. My policy advice was to make thinner dollar bills, and then the pile would only go halfway to the moon. Clinton said something similar to Reagan, so Republicans and Republicans are equally clueless when it comes to government budgets and the national debt. To make matters worse, the value of a dollar isn't fixed, so using an image that depends on the width of the physical currency is that much more ridiculous. Another example of how otherwise bright people become dim as a doorknob when it comes to budgetary policy, Al Gore talked about putting the Social Security Trust Fund in a lockbox to ensure it would be there in 75 years. If we lock the green pieces of paper away, then in 75 years we take them out, but we don't have the goods and services needed, what good does the money do us? On the other hand, if we have the goods and services we need, we can always create the green pieces of paper. The social security question is not about money. It is about whether in 75 or however many years in the future, the working population at that time will be productive enough to produce the food and housing and other necessaries for itself and the non-working population at that time. That is not about money at all, but about real resources and productivity. It is also not about any intergenerational transfer of resources. This would all be funny if lives and livelihoods were at stake here. Imagine the human costs if social security programs were destroyed because it was thought government was going to run out of money. That would be like the math teacher saying, class is canceled, we've run out of numbers. With school budgets cut because we can't afford to educate our children, that last example seems painfully close to reality.